Film, including their curator, Josephine Shea. So why a collaboration uh, today with uh, the Etzel and Eleanor Ford House? Um, I mean, I think many of you know a little bit about the, a bit of the history of the Eleanor and Ford House, but it was completed in 1929. Uh, that's right in the middle of this four-year period that Wayland Gregory was at Cranbrook. Um, he was here from 1929 to 1933. Um, they, of course, have a great decorative arts collection, fine arts collection in the home, uh, including a work by Wayland Gregory. And that's what sparked uh, the idea of bringing together the Ford House and its curator uh, with us here at Cranbrook today. So for those of you that are uh, DIA members and not Cranbrook Art Museum members, um, of course, we'd love to have you support us as well. Uh, we have a little bit of an incentive going on right now for anybody that becomes a new member of Cranbrook Art Museum between now and the end of March. Uh, you'll receive one of our newest books, a book that we published last year. Uh, that uh, documented an exhibition that Anders Ruald, the current head of the ceramics department, uh, did in Sarnen House. But as much as documenting that exhibition, it also really documents the interiors of Sarnen's, Sarnen House as well, which is um, another one of the great historic house museums uh, in the area. Uh, but we are here today to learn more about Cranbrook's first head of the ceramics department, Waylon Gregory. Uh, although his tenure at Cranbrook was very brief, lasting less than four years, the work that he created here would influence his entire career, both his monumental ceramic sculptures and his later unique multiples, but more on that later by one of our speakers. So why a collaborate, well, no, we already did that, so. <laughs> uh, so this is how it's going to work this afternoon. After I do introduce both Shoshana and Josephine, each of them will lecture here in the auditorium starting with Josephine. When they are finished, we're then going to go up into the galleries uh, where we'll have a chance to uh, look at the works in the exhibition with them. And that's also where we'll take uh, questions and answers so that we can be doing it uh, in front of the actual objects instead of uh, images. Uh, we're going to keep the museum open until 5.30 today, so we'll have plenty of time to look and talk. So a few introductions now. Uh, Shoshana first. Shoshana Resnikoff joined the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research in 2012 and has since curated two exhibitions, A Driving Force, Cranbrook and the Car, which is in the gallery outside the auditorium, and Crafting a Life, George Goff Booth and the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts, which is on display at Cranbrook House. Perhaps even more important for us today, however, she also serves as the venue curator for the current Wayland Gregory exhibition, which was organized by the University of Rich Richmond Museums. The founding editor of the center's blog, The Cranbrook Kitchen Sink, and if you're not already uh, getting weekly e-blasts from us, I'd encourage you to sign up for The Cranbrook Kitchen Sink. Shoshana regularly researches and writes about Cranbrook's collection. In 2012, she received her Master of Arts in American Material Culture from the Winterthur Program in American Material Culture at the University of Delaware. Prior to graduate school, she worked at the Chicago History Museum and Gray Towers National Historic Site. A graduate of Emory University, Shoshana received her BA in American Studies in 2008. Josephine Shea is curator of the Etzel and, <laughs> pardon? <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Josephine Shea is curator of the Etzel and Eleanor Ford House and an adjunct faculty member in the Liberal Arts Department at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit. Active in the field nationally, Josephine has served as an interviewer for the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art Project for Craft Documentation and worked on the 2009 Renwick Craft Invitational in Washington, D.C. She has served as a juror for the American Craft Council and presented papers at the 2010 Crafting a Nation Conference and the 2012 Textile Society of America Biennial Symposium. 
With an undergraduate degree in the history of art from Michigan State University, Josephine holds an MA in the history of decorative arts from the program that was operated jointly by the Smithsonian Associates and Corcoran College of Arts and Design in Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Josephine Shea. <laughs> I'll put both shake in your hand. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, it's always a delight to be here at Cranbrook, and it's a special pleasure to be included with Shoshana to talk a little more uh, deeply about the current ex one of the current exhibitions um, up on the uh, gallery. And it's an opportunity for me to kind of share things that I've been thinking about and issues that um, if there were, there are graduates um, in the audience of Cranbrook, how does an artist make a living? And Waylon Gregory's approach to that, I think, is interesting and bears examination, so I appreciate your being here to go on this journey. Um, I thought it was interesting, and we did lose a little bit of my fabulous um, matching typeface w to Waylon Gregory. Um, this is his in uh, advertisement for basically kind of a trade document. And I apologize, it's a Xerox of a black and white, but I think you hopefully will recognize familiar images of his work. And what was particularly interesting for me is how he describes himself um, to basically a trade audience as a sculptor a designer, and a producer. So, oh, um, so let's dive in. But I did not learn about Wayland Gregory until I came to Edsel and Elner Ford House, and particularly this piece that uh, Greg mentioned, which is a terracotta horse head, and I think will look familiar to us when we view the exhibit or review the exhibit. Um, it's part of a, very, a small but um, for me and lovers of early 20th century uh, ceramics, a uh, uh, collection that the Edsel and Eleanor Ford collected. Um, up above on the top left, you see Henry Varnum Poor's piece, and on the lower right, a small um, piece by Otto and Gertrude Natzler. And to give you a little context and show some images I don't always get to share, to give you the context, Edsel Ford is the only son of Henry and Clara Ford. Henry, of course, is the founder of Ford Motor Company. And he married, as this uh, newspaper points out, um, he's the son of the Motor King's car who marries the society girl. And the society girl was Eleanor Clay, who was the niece and actually grew up with J.L. Hudson. And um, while apparently uh, uh, Henry Ford was a lover of photographs of art, uh, Edsel and El Eleanor enjoyed art and art collecting, and it was really a passion that they shared in their home, and then also there are many examples to be enjoyed at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And just a small textile uh, note here, this is her wedding gown, which was designed by Lucille. They start off with surrounded in a small way with some ceramics. They commissioned a Puabic piece, but interestingly, the home that they built at Gockler Point, when there was a high rise erected next to them, does not include any Puabic. And it includes these interiors, which if you haven't seen, I encourage you to come to Fort House, um, that were um, done in the mid 30s by I have to keep my three named people <laughs> straight, uh, Walter Dorman Teague. So this is Henry II's bedroom, their oldest son, with a Charles Culver um, up there on the wall. So basically, Teague got the commission to redo these interiors, and that's where you see these ceramic pieces, um, including one of my personal favorites, that's actually on my LinkedIn page um, of Maya Grotel's work. And so we have to go back 
And I apologize again for the blurry uh, visual, but unbeknownst to me, we actually have two pieces of Wayland Gregory's work in our collection. We have this very small, it's probably about four inches in diameter, dish. And when I found this dish, I of course looked at the signature and of course eBay to see and of course quickly discovered that this type of work was um, pretty accessible, although valued and appreciated. And it was an interesting contrast to me to read uh, the descriptions of the work at the time, which um, have that wonderful kind of breathy, breathless um, enthusiasm for, uh, it describes Teague's work and it's telling about, talking about these small pieces of work. Um, like Shakespeare, he never repeats himself. And then he fashions and sign each, signs each piece thousands each season so that everyone is original. And I found this contrast of what is almost verging on mass production being very carefully portrayed as handmade and custom created. But we have to begin at the beginning. And since we had William Wegman here a while ago, we're going to see some cat images starting off with a yet very young Wegelin Gregory, born in Kansas City, educated, a farmer's son, um, very much a product of the Midwest, but a very um, kind of Renaissance personality who's both interested in uh, mathematics and engineering and chemistry and art and is even, a, as you can see here, a musician. Um, he goes to, and there's our uh, one of, our, our second cat image, um, he works with Laredo Taft, which Tom Folk talked about in Chicago at the Midway Studios, and Gregory talks about his time there as really almost working in a Renaissance uh, artist studio, and I think it had a huge impact on his work. I was very um, struck because I'm, of course, looking again at the fountain images. This is Laredo's Taft uh, design for, I think it was called the Fountain of Time, um, a large commission that still is, exists. But there is always this, seems to be with Gregory, this back and forth between maybe the academy and production, or the artist atelier, and his back and forth in Chicago is with the Midland Terracotta Company. So he is there working, obviously learning large scale production and projects. And he quickly gets projects of his own, including uh, the Aztec Room at a hotel and also a theater. And he very self-consciously goes about looking at examples in Chicago to make his um, presentations as historically accurate as possible. And this is still, as you can tell, I think by the photograph, a very young and very intense um, Waylon Gregory, looking quite artistic. S but he goes to work for really probably um, one of the biggest ceramic firms in the country, which is located or was located just outside of Cleveland, um, called the Cowan Pottery. And those, I always say everything's connected. In this case, um, one of the connections is, of course, our guy Cowan. And I, again, blurry image, but you can see um, Cowan is kneeling there to the right of Thelma Fraser Winter. And then, interestingly enough, the only person not wearing a worker's smock is Waylon Gregory. He is there in shirt sleeves and tie. I'm not sure exactly what that means. But C Cohen, or Cohen traces his connections to Alfred and to Benz and the whole trajectory of ceramics. And the, their production, as that previous slide pointed out, was massive. 
um, thousands of ceramic pieces going out across the country. And so it worked in a situation where artists are designing and creating sculptures and then molds and then different ceramic um, glazes are used. And I could not resist this connection to the automotive trade. Uh, spray guns are being used, the same kind of spray uh, guns that are used for putting automotive paint on are being used in this mass production, I use the term loosely, um, studio setting. At c and um, it makes a point up in the exhibit, uh, Gregory is one of several uh, artists that are connected to the studio besides Cohen. Um, one of the best known besides Gregory is Victor Schackengost, and we see his work. But the point that I kind of see is Gregory's work is within this context of the Cleveland School and what we now think of as Art Deco, these extended elongated female forms with that uh, feeling of motion and drapery and of course very often look, looking at beautiful things including the female figure. But I think these moments were very important for Gregory because basically he sees the shutdown of the pottery due to the depression. So this once thriving ceramic um, concern basically is a victim of the depression and I cannot not believe that as Gregory thinks about himself and his career that that was very much in his thought about how do I make a living. Um, and be careful what you wish for. Uh, I was just rereading the letter <laughs> from Gregory up in the gallery. Uh, Gregory very much wanted to come to Cranbrook. Of course, the setting is the demise of the pottery. And he gets his wish, and George Booth brings him to Cranbrook. It's not a completely happy story, but um, it's a very productive time, as Greg pointed out, in, uh, Greg in Waylon Gregory's career. So where he creates what are these kind of now iconic um, images, including there's a re repetition of horses that we get to see quite a bit of. And I've always been somewhat amused by um, this image of the very important uh, ceramic um, nationals that were held um, at the Everson. And uh, it seems a little bit, I don't know how you feel about this, incestuous. I mean, that is basically Waylon Gregory's former boss um, in the center there holding uh, the, the awarded, prize awarded piece by Gregory. Um, so it can be a very small ceramic world. And he is creating sculptures. He is creating, which what Susanna will talk about, large scale pieces. And then he is creating these multiples. And I thought it was very interesting that this is a basically a decorating magazine, House Beautiful, and they very much bring up the case that these are American products, although they note the influence. And I think it's a very important one of the Cleveland School, which had a very much a back and forth between Vienna and Austria, that I think sometimes when we think about Art Deco and France and Germany, gets kind of uh, submerged. But uh, polo horses that can play across your table and uh, zebras that can frolic across your tablecloth. And again, there's this repeated, even in a small cut line, uh, it describes these uh, zebras as hand carved and hand decorated. And uh, my favorite image, so I will linger on it, um, very much sold as opposed to the pottery that he worked for. 
to a consciously upper class or aspirational upper class market because you had to be wealthy to be able to, as it points out in one of the um, periodicals a day, flick your lucky into his $200 ashtray. And we're talking 1940s, 50s prices. So this is um, what a tablescape that might, the format uh, may look familiar, that features Waylon Gregory's designs. And um, again, it's just almost cut off at the very bottom there, but the handmade Gregory pottery is being featured by Carson Perry Scott. And again, it, and this moves forward in time. This is 1950. You can go to the W&J Sloan uh, sales room, pick out your piece, which will then be custom made for you. And I did have to both be amused and point out the use of the word unique. Um, the, which is overworked by this writer, but then gets applied to Waylon Gregory's tabletop designs. And so just to kind of think about this and production, and it much is made about his signatures. They're sometimes stamped, but pretty much, as it points out, usually signed. But are they really being signed by Waylon Gregory? Uh, I was looking at the paintings. There seems to be a wide variety of signatures, and I do think these pieces are by, they're definitely Gregory's pieces. He signs them copyright New York. Sometimes, um, this is my most dramatically different. Usually there's an attempt to make this kind of swirl. Um, here it's straight up and down, but you still have to have, um, Gregory is very interested in copyright. Um, sometimes it's incised. And just to bring that up a little closer, it's a completely different G. Um, to put on your FBI handwriting analysis, um, a G that's not closed. And there is just, uh, so although there is this importance attached to signing these pieces, as opposed to impressing them, which a lot of uh, ceramic artists do, um, there just seems to be a lot of wide variety there. Um, although there is some variety with the paintings up in the, in the exhibit, so I encourage you to look more closely. Um, to wrap up our story quickly and get onto the larger scale, I'm using this as a transition, as a somewhat prescient um, example of his work, um, which he continues to produce up top this mountain, which many of his clients come to, not just the trade shows that he's doing, but up to this fabulous environment that he's created. And unfortunately, there isn't exactly a happy ending. Um, although he leaves for what he believes will be creating an art colony, I'm guessing somewhat based on the Cranbrook model, but that is another story for buying and a reason to buy the book. So I will bid you adieu with this slide and hand off to Sean. It's fun for me to, to follow up um, Josephine because, um, you know, um, uh, Gregory's Gregory's production works, his smaller works, those continue throughout his entire career. He starts with them, he ends with them. As Josephine pointed out, um, his engagement with production work is, is about his art and his artistry, but it's also about making a living. Um, it's, about, it's about being su successful and making a name for himself. Um, his large-scale scale sculpture is, is something else. It's a little different, but there are these moments of overlap uh, that make him, I think, a very interesting practitioner. Um, really, one of the things that's so interesting about his large-scale sculpture, um, his, his large public commissions, is that he only does it for a stretch of basically 1936 to 1942. Um, he does some, some other you know, large sculptures uh, after, but that's really the, the, the bulk of his large-scale sculpture work. Um, and so to, to have um, 
such a prolific artist create so much work over the course of his life and then do his biggest pieces for just a very small period of time is, I think, something very, very interesting. Um, as Josephine so ably explained, um, uh, Gregory really learns the, the nuts and bolts of, of sculpture uh, in the shop of, or in the, the studio of Lerato Taft. And um, uh, I like that she also showed this picture. I think we both liked it because of the cat. Um, I, wish I, I wish there was a, a better reason, but the cat really is what did it for me. Um, but one thing that I do think is interesting is um, this is the Fountain of Time as, um, no, sorry, the Fountain of the Great Lakes as um, uh, Josephine pointed out. And you can see that this is huge. I mean, these are huge sculptures. And so uh, for a man who goes from here to, to, to Cohen Pottery, this is kind of a, a crash course in making things big. Um, and you can see this is the Fountain of Time in Chicago. And just for the scale alone, it's an important image. Um, that man is, I'm sure, I don't know, 5'10". He's absolutely dwarfed by this piece. Um, you can see, too, that, that Taft is introducing uh, Gregory to the idea of an allegorical figure in, in these sculptures and in these fountains. And that's something that Gregory definitely takes from Taft, um, the, the, these kind of metaphorical or allegorical figures. Um, but you can also see that Taft is working completely in the Beaux-Arts style. This is very, this is very classical. This is, he, you know, he, Taft does the sculpture work for the Columbian Exposition, the 1893 World's Fair. So, you know, um, Burnham's grand Beaux-Arts statement about Chicago, he's doing the sculpture work for it. It's very much a, a late 19th century style of, of sculpture. Um, and so Gregory is taking this idea of allegory, but as we see, he puts his own spin on it and really starts incorporating um, imagery that we feel, that we think of as being very 20th century, very of the moment. Um, so this is, this is uh, the Nouch Dancer, one of the Cohen pieces, and you can see he's starting to look at movement, he's starting to look at form, as Josephine pointed out, very deco. Um, and then he comes to Cranbrook. Um, and these pieces are still small. They're still pieces that can move with a person from place to place. They are more sculptural, they're not functional, but they, they are, are decorative. Um, and uh, as Josephine said, the relationship is a complicated one between Cranbrook and Gregory. He, he advocates for his position here, and really one of the, the interesting things that he says um, as, uh, in advocating for his position uh, is that he, he's excited to come to Cranbrook because he'll be a ceramic sculptor, and Carl Millis is, is a bronze sculptor. So they won't interfere, they won't compete. Um, I don't know what their relationship was like. Um, I think it wasn't always great. Um, but I do think that in coming to Cranbrook, um, he's in positioning himself as a ceramic sculptor, he ends up also learning quite a bit from Carl Millis. Um, uh, the relationship uh, sours further between the administration and um, Gregory, they don't, they don't agree on the terms of his contract. They don't agree on, on how he should sell his work, how he should pay for his materials, um, how many classes he has to teach. Um, and, and really, um, things come to a head when, um, uh, as you'll see up in the gallery, a, a letter explaining that um, the, uh, the Cranbrook administration declares that the power is going to be shut off to the, to the kilns uh, to protect or to conserve energy. Gregory is not happy about that. He fires up the kiln anyway, has a whole batch of work in there, um, and then uh, someone from Cranbrook goes and shuts it off while the work uh, is still firing, um, destroying the batch of artwork, and that's really the straw that breaks the camel's back. Gregory's out. He stays until June, but then he's, he's gone. Um, and actually, a lawsuit uh, emerges from this as well. So it's, it's an acrimonious relationship, uh, to be sure. Uh, but there's also absolutely no question that he's learning from Millis. Um, if you think about that large-scale uh, uh, fountain of time, uh, Lorado Taft sculpture, and you think about um, just how serious and intimidating and formal that, that design is, and how much more movement there is in this, and how much more liveliness and an engagement with with myth in almost a playful way, as opposed to the seriousness of the mythology of Taft, I, I can't believe that, that Gregory isn't looking at that through the rest of his career when he's making work. Um, even up to uh, Gregory's take on the swimmer, um, the piece at the top is Wayland Gregory's maquette for a large swimmer 
fountain. Um, he, he constructs this residential fountain. Um, I think it's at some point in his Fifth Avenue apartment and then later also in his uh, house in New Jersey. Um, and this is the fount the swimmer is at the center and then there are, there's a pool around it. Um, and this maquette is up in the gallery. And then this is um, a, a, a Carl Millis piece that we have here in our collection. And there's, you know, there's so much similarity, so much kind of uh, similar organic curves, similar shape. Um, I, I truly believe that Gregory is, is learning from Millis um, on some level at least. So Gregory leaves Cranbrook on, on bad terms but also potentially with some inspiration. Um, and he uh, begins to start investigating this idea of larger scale sculpture. And um, he perfects this system that he calls his honeycomb technique where he creates this sort of substructure um, and, over, and lays over that uh, a, thin, a thin skin of clay. Uh, and that allows these pieces to get very large without falling in on themselves. Um, it also, however, makes them incredibly heavy, which we can talk about more up in the gallery. It, it presented a, quite a challenge in installing this exhibition, just the sheer weight of these large pieces. And with this system and with this technique, he's able to start on he, these larger scale commissions. Um, the first of them is Light Dispelling Darkness, which is um, a fountain created for Roosevelt Park in New Jersey. It's produced as a works progress administration project. Um, and, and intriguingly, Gregory is also the head of the New Jersey uh, WPA um, uh, um, committee. So I, I think he probably was looking out for the best, uh, best projects for himself, which, you know, I understand. Um, and um, it's inspired by Thomas Edison um, and also the grand progress of human civilization. So definitely not a small project by any stretch. Um, you can see here that, he's, that uh, his studio assistants are working on the central pillar of the, of the sculpture. The central pillar is made out of um, concrete and it's um, a, re a relief that details a man's accomplishments, science, education, exploration, um, and it's topped by this giant terracotta globe. It's a glazed terracotta globe um, that shows the world. Uh, surrounding the pillar, though, is where things get a little crazier. Um, you get these six ter glazed terracotta figures right here and there and there and then two, three more on the back side uh, that represent the evils and ills that prey on men. Um, and here is that picture that Josephine showed us. Um, and this is Gregory working on uh, one of these terracotta figures um, representing war, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and he is, I think, so great because you can see that's, that's Gregory's horse head. It's the exact same horse head. Um, he has an affinity for, for these forms that repeat themselves again and again. Um, but then, of course, the next figures um, are, oh, sorry, I should say, this is it, beautifully glazed, um, really kind of psychedelic in its coloration, and it only gets crazier. Um, uh, you have uh, Death, who's also a horseman of the apocalypse, and then you have Famine, who's quite frankly terrifying, uh, and then you have Pestilence, who's just groovy. I love that, it's, just, it's so great. I mean, also sad, very sad and scary, but, but groovy. Um, and uh, so that's, that's our, our final horseman of the four. And then we get greed, which are two octopi strangling each other, um, which is uh, uh, both uh, creative and also very vivid. I mean, I wouldn't think to, I wouldn't look at that and say, oh, that's greed, but now that I know it is, it's just kind of gross and visceral. Um, and then the final one, my personal favorite, uh, materialism. Um, and so you've got your, your um, greedy men uh, who are now suffering because the, you can see from this ticker tape, the stock market has crashed. So this is very timely, um, uh, perhaps even too timely. I imagine it would have uh, been a bit of a sore subject in uh, um, 1936 and seven when this was completed. Um, so he completes this project and I should say it's still in Roosevelt Park. Um, if you ever find yourself in New Jersey, you should go visit it. Uh, it's by Menlo Park. It's, um, yeah, so, yeah. It's, sorry, no, I'm not, I'm from the West Coast, so my knowledge of New Jersey is not that, not that good, but it's, um, it's basically right by Edison's workshop. So if you're ever hanging out by Edison's place, go check this out. Um, it was recently restored. It was in pretty terrible condition, um, but it was uh, restored quite beautifully, I think. Um, the, the next project that he works on is RFD. Um, it's a, a mural for um, the uh, 
Columbus, Kansas post office. Um, in the, 19, in the late 1930s, um, there are a number of uh, post office projects associated with the New Deal. Um, and they're not uh, Works Progress Administration projects, but they're part of the Treasury Section of Fine Arts, um, which is also a New Deal undertaking. Um, and this is a terracotta relief showing a, a friendly mounted postal worker in Kansas. And I think clearly hearkening back to Gregory's uh, Midwestern roots, as Josephine referred to. Um, the third public commission that Gregory creates is uh, arguably the most controversial, and I think the one that most reflects his, um, his, pretty, his pretty liberal, even socialist leanings. Um, this is called Democracy in Action. Uh, it was designed for the upper story of Washington, D.C.'s Municipal Center Building, which is uh, the home of the, the Metropolitan Police Department uh, for D.C. Um, and it's completed in 1941. Uh, also funded through the New Deal, um, and uh, it features civil servants, mostly firefighters, and you can see them there, and police officers um, at work, um, and it's a complicated portrayal of civil servants. Some of them are doing good, the firefighters are putting out fires, as one would expect them to, um, while others are abusing their power, uh, and um, here you can see where that abuse of power is taking place, and here is a close-up um, uh, it's a close-up of police officers beating unarmed men, potentially African-American protesters, although we don't know for sure. Um, and it's a very critical piece, really, to put on a mural <laughs> at a police station. Um, and it received quite a bit of criticism. Uh, the police chief at the time received a letter from a local minister saying that it looked like it was portraying the Gestapo, not American police officers. Um, I think that's interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that um, in 1941, the word Gestapo would have had even more weight, I think than it has now, um, and it would have had a very direct implication. You know, Americans are starting to get a, a lot of news about, about what's happening in Germany, and, and we're about to enter World War I, World War II, sorry. Um, and so it's a, it's a weighty word to be throwing around about a terracotta mural. Um, uh, one DC cop uh, sort of defended the mural. Um, uh, he felt that he could rationalize its presence on the building because um, as, as, as a, New Jersey and New York resident, he was splitting his time at the, at the time between the two cities, or state and city. Um, Gregory's exposure to cops was primarily New York police officers. So this is totally behavior you would expect of a New York police officer, according to the DC cop, not of DC cops. So that's the justification for this piece. But regardless, um, uh, it, it stays up, it's still up there. Um, uh, and uh, Paul Manship actually comes to Gregory's defense in the press about, about the piece. Um, and here's the maquette for the piece um, that's on view in the gallery, so we can take a closer look at it upstairs. Um, the final project I'll talk about uh, is the Fountain of the Atom. It's not a New Deal project, but it's too good not to discuss, and it is certainly monumental. Um, it's created for the 1939 uh, World's Fair in New York, in, New York, in Flushings, um, and uh, it really is where we get to go back to Gregory's allegorical roots. And you know, we saw it in the... In, um, uh, uh, the, the Roosevelt Park fountain, but you see it again here. Um, and also kind of engaging with, with uh, kind of active myth-making about atomic energy. You know, atomic energy is something of our time. It's, it doesn't have this history, but he sort of creates this romantic uh, history for it, which I think is very interesting. Um, it features eight electrons on the lower level, meant to represent the male and female components um, of an atom. Uh, and then on the um, upper level, it, it has four elements, um, earth, air, fire, and water. And so it's a very romantic understanding of atomic energy um, that doesn't really reflect scientific understanding, but perhaps it engages with um, contemporary uh, ideas about, about the atom. You know, we're entering the atomic age. This is exciting. It's, it's romantic even to see what's going to happen with this. Um, and so that's, I think, what this piece is reflecting. Um, at the center of the fountain is, um, uh, these are g glass bricks, I believe, and piped through the glass bricks is gasoline that ignites um, at the top. So it was belching out fire. And then, there, and then there's water. I mean, this is a crazy piece to have in a public display like the World's Fair. Um, uh, and in fact, um, uh, in an amateur film about the World's Fair, they describe it as um, surrealism on the Bowling Green to give you a sense of, of um, the the um, way that it was received. Um, and uh, it, our exhibition uh, here at, at Cranbrook, uh, I think is, is the largest 
recollection of these pieces since the fair. Um, they went off to various places. In our gallery, we have uh, four electrons and two elements. Um, uh, and uh, this is air, which is currently in a private collection. Um, and there are, I, I, don't, I wasn't able to find a much more recent photo of it than this. Um, and then of course, water, which we have upstairs and is in Cranbrook's collection and is one of the big weight problems that we faced uh, with this exhibition. Um, and that is, of course, Wayland Gregory with water at his home in New Jersey. Um, and some, some say, and I think that there is merit to this, that there is a, a physical similarity between Wayland Gregory and water. And it's um, somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat of a self-portrait. Um, uh, Tom Folk in his book also suggests that perhaps he's modeled after his studio assistant. So having sort of taken this journey throughout Gregory's life um, through the, the production works, um, I'm glad that we also get a chance to look at this very brief but very, very um, fruitful period of his life. Um, that really closes my portion of the talk, um, but I will allow our, um, one of our amazing visitor services staff and uh, uh, preparators, PD, to uh, emulate water here as we were getting ready to install the show, uh, and uh, I guess invite everyone up to the galleries so we can talk some more about these incredible pieces. Thank you. Let's, um, let's thank them first of all down here. <laughs>